Good morning, grade 11s. Hope you are all healthy and doing well. Um, we are going to be finishing off our discussion on cell signaling. So at this point now, we have been talking about what happens to cells, for example, how do they actually send messages to each other in the first place? It could be either short distances, long distances. It can be um, using ligands to signal themselves or to target other cells. So what we're gonna be looking at now is how does the cell actually, um, once it is signaled, how does it elicit a response? So, Basically, uh, basic beginning to this is when you're looking at any scenario where this uh, cell is going to respond to a certain situation, there's three, I guess, main processes. The first one, uh, reception, would be as you can see in the diagram here, right? Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be a hormone, although we will be talking about that quite a bit. It could be any type of ligand the ligand comes and attaches to the receptor. And then what we classify as signal transduction is when the cell is going to then respond somehow to that signal, that reception. So it's actually, it's very complicated the way these cells work. We are gonna give some examples momentarily, but basically it's a matter of sending the message. So uh, there are usually a series of reactions that are going to occur during a signal transduction. Um, it doesn't just happen automatically. There's going to be uh, a message sent within the cell to eventually elicit some sort of response. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you some examples of ones that are very well studied and very well documented. Uh, this first one is called phosphorylation cascades, and the term is here. Now, if you take a look at this, it's actually not that hard to follow. So for example, here at the top, we have some sort of ligand that is attached to the receptor. Now, in this case here, we're looking at an enzyme called protein kinase. And protein kinase needs to be activated in order for it to allow a cellular response. So I want you to look at closely at this diagram here. So initially the protein kinase is inactive. What actually is going to allow it to be active? If you look at the diagram here, what do you see happening? Take a look here, take a look here, look in the middle. What is happening? Why would this be called phosphorylation? Well, each time the protein kinase is being activated, notice that it is gaining a phosphate group. Where is a phosphate group coming from? It's coming from the ATP changing into an ADP. So recall that the ATP is being oxidized here. And what's happening is we're losing a phosphate group and that's why it would be called phosphorylation because the protein the protein kinase is being activated that way, and it's a cascade because it's happening multiple times. If you take a look at the final situation, in order to activate another protein, not the actually the protein kinase itself, to elicit some sort of cellular response, you have the protein kinase involved in putting the phosphate group onto that final protein. So this is, like I said, this one's called phosphorylation cascade, and it's a very well-documented one, so you should be able to explain that. This is another one that is very well documented, and this is more, if you take a look, it's actually looking at the receptor itself. So first of all, in order for this to occur, you have a messenger coming in, the ligand, and attaching to this G-protein coupled receptor. Now, attached to this G-protein coupled receptor is a G-protein. Notice also what is attached here is a GDP molecule. That should hopefully be familiar to you. If you recall, the, when we actually saw GDP and GTP was in substrate level phosphorylation when we were looking at the citric acid cycle. In order for the ATP to gain that phosphate group and create the ADP 
to become an ATP, you needed this GDP, this molecule, this secondary molecule. So here we see it again. So the GDP, then you get a phosphate group added here to make it GTP. Once that GTP is present, it can it could potentially now again this is actually not just one example it can do there's different ways of things but for example in this scenario this g protein now with the gdp is going to activate this enzyme and then the enzyme is in turn going to activate a messenger and then that will produce some sort of cellular response okay so this looks very complicated but i'm just going to highlight a few things here for you so that you can just see uh, what's important. Okay, so not everything here you have to know. Okay. All right, so first of all, let's look at this top here. So this is actually um, an example of when you are using one of these G receptor, G protein coupled receptor molecules that are found in eukaryotic cells. So here is the receptor, the pink thing. E is supposed to represent the chemical epinephrine. Now, epinephrine is also called adrenaline. So for example, if you are stressed or nervous or you're about to do a race or you get scared, what happens is your nervous system, which we're going to talk about in more detail later on, will cause the release of adrenaline from your adrenal gland. And ad adrenaline and epinephrine, same thing, is a type of hormone. And this hormone will float through your blood and it will target certain cells. So in this case here, you can see that it is targeting a cell. Uh, the, here is our GDP and it's changing into a GTP. It's going to activate this enzyme as we saw before. Now, I wanted to add a little bit more to this because um, this is actually a nice combination of showing you that you can have multiple things happening at once. This molecule here, uh, this is called cyclic AMP. Very, very common uh, secondary messenger when you're looking at uh, uh, sending messages within the cell. So this secondary messenger, and it actually is cyclic adenine monophosphate so it is similar to ATP but however it is actually cyclical and there's only one phosphate group so it's going to send a message now in this case here what it's actually going to do is it's going to cause the process of phosphorylation to occur which if we go back for a moment that was this scenario so do you see how we have actually now combined this with this. See, this would be the CAMP, right? And it's causing phosphorylation to take place in order for that cell to respond to the epinephrine that has now attached to the receptor. All right, hopefully that is that makes sense to you. This is another example of what can happen inside of the cell once it is triggered. And this one's kind of interesting. It's called signal amplification, meaning, and if you think of like an amplifier and how, I remember we talked about this in grade eight, I know that was a long time ago, where you have a, like the electricity coming in, it gets collected and then it gets amplified. So imagine that's kind of what's taking place here. So in order for this to happen, there's a series of reactions and it actually notice that you're starting out with only three molecules and then you gain nine and so on and so forth. So you're actually amplifying the signal. They could be different molecules. They could be similar ones in order for some sort of cellular response to take place. So this is another very well documented one as well. Now, up to the, this point here, we have been talking about, you can see at the beginning, where the ligand is actually attaching to a receptor that's on the surface, okay, of the membrane. There is another type, slightly different, but you can have similar results and similar responses. Okay, now if you take a look at this picture, 
This is a little bit different. These are called intracellular receptors. So instead of the receptor being out here on the plasma membrane, it's actually already inside just below the plasma membrane. Now, a hormone, now it could be a hormone, but it has to be actually a special type of, type of molecule called a steroid. Steroids do this, and steroids are very important messengers, ligands. So what happens with steroids is they can actually, they're soluble, so they can move through the plasma membrane, even though it has a slightly negative charge. And it can go in and it will attach to the receptor that's already in there. Now what's really interesting about steroids is they can do another type of modification in the cell. And what this one is going to be is gene modification. And if you recall, when we were talking earlier, we talked about how you can have certain genes expressed at certain times. This is a way of controlling it. So notice what's happening here. The receptor and the steroid will actually go into the nucleus, will attach to the DNA, will produce some type of mRNA, and then that mRNA is actually going to be translated into some type of protein that the cell requires. So depending on the steroid, it will only attach to certain receptors. So you could actually have multiple different receptors in here, and then you can have different DNA, not different DNA, sorry, different receptors attaching to the DNA in different locations and producing, transcribing different mRNA strands and producing even different types of proteins. All right, so that is all I have to say for today. This is quite complicated. Hopefully I was able to explain it. Um, in a way that you will understand. And uh, take care, and um, we will uh, communicate again soon. Thank you.